starts right now. In a unanimous vote, Bear County commissioners approving paying nearly $12,000 to members of two grand juries. It's for their service during the early stages of the pandemic. Paul Venema with the vote and the significance of that service that even amidst the moratorium on jury service. Instead of calling it hazard pay, pay as um, local um, administrative um, judge um, Ron Renhell um, called it last week. But I think hazard pay would be appropriate. Uh, Commissioners uh, called it uh, supplemental pay, at least Wyatt officially. I mean, since it is hazard pay. Commissioner Justin Rodriguez noted that in mid-March, the jurors voluntarily agreed to serve an additional two months when the pandemic hit and a moratorium was ordered on jury service. But for their willingness to step up, uh, then we may have some people that, that may not get uh, indicted on charges that are very serious. So. Got a motion to second all those in favor will say aye. I suppose no, the ayes have it. With that, commissioners agreed to pay each juror an additional $65 a week, plus the additional $40 a day they get for jury duty. The additional pay, $11,960. I think it was justified in the sense that these were individuals that uh, went above and beyond. They didn't have to stick around for an extra two months, but they did it. And uh, again, particularly under this environment. According to the agenda item commissioners uh, approved, uh, the jurors also uh, saved the county the considerable uh, expenses of having to impanel two new grand juries. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. A COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine trial is getting ready to begin here in San Antonio. And starting tonight, researchers are looking for five to 600 participants to begin the screening process. Some of the criteria, you must be 18 or older and not have had COVID-19 before. And if you do have underlying conditions like diabetes or hypertension, they must be managed. First responders and other frontline workers at high risk of contracting COVID-19 are especially encouraged to apply. Researchers assure you cannot contract the virus from the vaccine. The vaccine itself is not a live vaccine, uh, a vaccination type of process. You cannot get COVID vaccine or COVID uh, from this vaccine, but we are using parts of that to, for the, our bodies to be able to make antibodies towards those parts of the, of the virus. The participants will receive two rounds of injections, the second booster shot to be given about a month after the first. They'll also receive a small stipend. We have details on how to get involved right now on KSAT.com. For weeks they argued, but now Mayor Ron Nirenberg and VIA officials have agreed on how to spend the big bucks generated from a very small sales tax, just one eighth of a cent. It currently funds an aquifer protection program and the development of Linear Creek Parkways, but next year that expires, freeing up that money for other programs. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us how the city and the transit agency both aim to get a bite at that apple. The plan is a handoff. First, the city gets to use the tax money to fund workforce development plans. It will look like roughly uh, approximately three to four years. Then the tax revenue would go permanently to the Advanced Transportation District, where VIA would get half of the money. The agency's president and CEO says it would be used for the same kinds of improvements and expansions they had originally planned to use the tax dollars on before the pandemic hit, like increased bus frequency in the core area and more innovation farther out. And then we're, we're looking at how far we could go toward rapid transit with that portion of the funding. This deal follows weeks of squabbling that began with the mayor eyeing the tax dollars for economic recovery from the pandemic instead of transportation funding as he had originally planned. But whereas the VIA board chairwoman indicated last month they needed the tax to keep up current service levels, the agency now says it can do that with the $10 million in annual help the city plans to give it. But that money is still not a sure thing like the sales tax would be. That has to be approved by council. Um, and, you know, it, it's not secure. The, the plan, though, would need voter approval. The mayor and VIA want to get the pair of initiatives onto the November ballot. But dedicating the tax for a new purpose means shutting off that particular spigot of funding for the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. But the mayor says the city has plans for the future of that popular program, which he says should have enough money in the bank to last until 2023 anyways. There's a long runway ahead of us for us to get this uh, program finalized for sustainable path. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The Department of Public Safety investigating after a late night shooting at a convenience store in San Marcos involving a state trooper. It happened at the 7-Eleven along Wonder World Drive, not far from I-35, about 930. It's across the street from a Lowe's home improvement store. 
Investigators aren't saying much about the shooting, but they did say someone was shot. No information on how badly that person was hurt, whether they had a gun or what led up to the trooper opening fire. We're told the trooper is OK. Investigators were on the scene for several hours gathering evidence. The store reopened after midnight. San Antonio firefighters say they know what sparked an early morning house fire on the northeast side of the city. A woman fell asleep while smoking. Fire crews got the call to the 100 block of Covina around 430 this morning. Officials tell us the woman was using a styrofoam cup for an ashtray. When she dozed off, the cup caught the bed and a couch on fire. Another person in that home tried to put out the flames with a garden hose. They managed to keep it from spreading until firefighters got there and they made short work of the flames. No one was hurt. Quick look at time saver traffic right now. Trans guide camera at I 35, both the upper and lower lanes at Brooklyn. Smooth going at this hour. She was one of those people you just loved being around. 20 years ago, KSAT 12 made the decision to hire a South Texas journalist by the name of Rosinda Rios. Earlier this morning, she lost a year long battle with cancer at MD Anderson in Houston. Ursula Perry, one of our closest friends, takes a look back at a courageous and talented woman who touched our lives for many years. I guess this cold weather caught a lot of people off guard because this morning I saw a lot of people. I met Rosinda Rios back in 1995 at a station in Austin where we sat side by side. Her anchoring mornings, me weekends. Mutual admiration led to a friendship that has lasted 25 years. Touch. These are really, really cool. So if you have a chance to... KSAT would hire her in 2000. A talented anchor, live reporter, and a beautiful person inside and out. Rosinda exuded confidence as weekend anchor at KSAT and in her What's Driving You Crazy segments, as well as Defenders Investigations. In 2010, she joined USAA as a content manager, hosting webinars and mentoring staff and offering media coaching to executives there. But what she did outside the building was all about community. As the 2016 Latin American Heritage Fiesta Queen, she raised thousands of dollars and made hundreds of appearances that year. She worked on diversity initiatives at USAA too, including volunteering for Elevate, a gender equality organization, as as well as Adelante, the Hispanic diversity group. A Facebook page of friends of Rosinda is now filled with remembrances of her life and career. She would no doubt be blushing at all this attention, but on the inside, loving every minute. No one questions that this lovely woman is in heaven now, perhaps coaching the angels already. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Rosinda Rios leaves behind her husband of more than 25 years, Larry Burns, another KSAT alumni, as well as her sons, Gabriel and Noah. Our thoughts are with them tonight. She was 62. Other news that we are following today, the hot and dry conditions mean Bear County is now under a burn ban. County commissioners voted on it today, putting it into effect immediately. It will stay in effect for the next 90 days unless the commissioner's court or the county fire marshal deems the safety hazard is no longer there. People who live in the county can still burn their trash in burn barrels, but they must have metal mesh screens so that the fire stays in the barrel. No domestic burning is allowed. Those who violate the ban could be fined up to $500. Live look outside with live cam tonight. 97 it says, but we did hit triple digits again today. Oh, barely. It, I, I think it was about a 15 minute period okay. earlier today, but it counts. That's enough to count. And so we made it to 100 for the high temperature today. Oh, we just got an update actually. Okay, this just came in 101 for the high temperature. That's two degrees shy of the record and six degrees above the average for the day. And the morning low of 78 was three degrees above average. Take a look at the state. We're not breaking records today. Likely we were pretty much the rest of the week. Monday all the way through yesterday, we had a lot of records fall. That really wasn't the case today. We're starting to see these temperatures drop off just a little bit. Speaking of dropping, unfortunately, the aquifer is down another half a foot. And it continues to fall the 10 day average at 657.1, which keeps us in stage one watering restrictions and really just mold uh, reported today. It's on the low end temperatures right now. Hondo divine 100, 101 in Holotus. Randolph checking in at 197 at the airport in San Antonio. And this evening, a clear sky. Good weather to view the space station flyover. 856 p.m. 
That's when it starts, okay? 8.56 p.m. I'll have more details on that coming up in a few minutes, along with another drop in our temperatures, at least a small change in temperatures and a slight chance of a few showers. We'll talk about that coming up. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says the time for education and warnings is over. He wants to see anyone violating the city county public health ordinance to be cited. What the sheriff says he's doing tonight. Non critical COVID patients in Deep South Texas will soon be getting their treatment in a converted hotel. The Red Roof Inn in Laredo will be able to provide rooms for more than 100 patients. Officials say that will give local hospitals at capacity some relief. In the coming days, a health and human services nonprofit will help set up equipment and hospital beds at this hotel. The facility should be up and running in the next week. Back here at home, we are just moments away from today's daily briefing on local COVID-19 cases here in Bear County, and we are expecting city and county officials to address the discrepancy between confirmed cases of coronavirus versus probable cases. As you might have seen earlier today on our website, those two were separated out at the request of the state. Let's listen in to the mayor and the county judge. Along with Dr. Jinda Wu, who is our chief medical officer here at Metro Health in San Antonio, and Dr. Brian also who is the Chief Medical Officer for University Health System, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Today, uh, I want to go through these data, and we will not sugar sugarcoat this data as we have not from the beginning. Tonight, we are reporting 2,700 and 47 cases of COVID-19. If you are tracking day by day, that means we are reporting 5,501 cases tonight. Let me break down these numbers for you. Uh, of those cases, 691 are new cases from the last 24 hours. The bulk of the cases that we were reporting tonight are a result of a two-week delay in reporting from state test results. These are a curative lab test results that were not reported uh, from the state for the last two weeks and accounted for 3,951 of our cases. An additional 811 cases uh, were over the last week as Metro Health was converting its database uh, to a new digital system. It's important to note that this backlog did not affect patient notification. All patients were notified within three to four days of their lab, of their lab results returning, but it did affect, in the case of the, the delay from the state, some of the contact tracing. Uh, so this is very important to note that we are working to uh, clear out those backlogs and now we have successfully done that. Uh, it is uh, concerning to say the least though uh, that we move through uh, and we have these uh, numbers accurately for you, uh, which is exactly what we are committed to doing. We have now also 21 new deaths to report tonight, which brings the total to 229. <laughs> of these deaths, 10 are associated with congregate settings, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities. The other patients were hospitalized at various locations, and their rate, ages range from a person in her 20s to a person up to their 90s. Uh, this virus has now taken a total of 229 of our loved ones, 58 of them uh, previously residents of nursing homes and assisted living facilities. So let's please remember that each one of these people were, was a loved one, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a neighbor, certainly a loved one. And let's please keep them and, your, and their families in our thoughts and in our prayers. Tonight we are also reporting 1,202 people in the hospital, and that is, um, a, a, that's actually a, a good trend, a downward trend from yesterday, and that's two in a row for us. We do have 430 in the ICU and 277 on ventilators. I think that's up three from yesterday. Uh, in terms of capacity, we have 46% of ventilators available and 12% of hospital beds available. But our hospital system as a whole remains under severe stress, and so we're working very hard as we uh, will continue to do to, to uh, relieve that pressure on our hospital systems. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for trying to explain that data. I know it's a difficult thing to communicate, and I think you stated it right. Uh, I believe out of those 21 deaths, as you said today, uh, 10 of them nursing homes and assisted living, and I think those go back about seven days, I believe it was. So um, uh, it, it's it's difficult on some of these between the state, national government, and us. And uh, but thanks for explaining that. Uh, 
As, as the mayor stated, um, with 229 deaths now in our community, 58 of them were um, in nursing homes. And, and obviously that's a very uh, uh, source of concern. Um, our reports are showing that out of 11 nursing homes, and uh, at 11 uh, nursing homes and assisted living uh, are in double digits, uh, ranging anywhere from uh, 67 to 34 to 35 to 29 to 11. So that's some indication that we may continue to see some uh, uh, issues with our nursing home, and 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 uh, we're, so we're keeping a close eye on that and trying to help in in, in every way that we can. Uh, you know, you always try to look for a silver lining in uh, all these numbers. These numbers can be very, very confusing and overwhelming to you. Uh, but I guess we all have our our own prejudices to what we look. At, and I always look at the hospitals as the um, critical one. I think we all can clearly understand that. We know when a hospital's in, when somebody's in a hospital, we know whether they're in ICU, we know whether they're on ventilators. And and so th that's clear. Now the silver lining, don't wanna put a lot of hope in this, but there is a little bit of a silver lining. Uh, in the last four days, uh, we've gone from 1,267 people in the hospital to 1,202 uh, today, that's uh, a minus 65, but that's not long enough, I know. Uh, it's three days of showing some decline. Uh, hopefully that will continue and uh, we'll see over the next uh, few days whether that works. Uh, we're still doing pretty well in the jail and we'll have, uh, I think Sheriff Salazar with us uh, tomorrow night to uh, Go into it a little bit more, but our, num our number of inmates are climbing. Um, 3,652 now, and it's making it much harder to uh, manage the jail. The state still is not meeting its uh, responsibility to take paper-ready uh, inmates. I think we've got three or 400 of them uh, that should be in state uh, prison, but instead they're with us. Uh, but the sheriff will be here to explain uh, a little bit more about that to, tomorrow night, but the good news is that we are holding down our uh, number of positive cases in the jail, and at this point we have uh, a total of 76 positive in there with 21, 20, 21 of them having uh, symptoms in the balance, uh, asymptomatic. So they're doing a great job, but the pressure is really building up on us uh, because of the state's uh, failure, to do, failure to do what they ought to be doing. Thank you, Judge. And as always, you can get the latest updates and all the data that is on the website at covid19.sanantonio.gov. You can also sign up for text updates uh, on COVID-19 by texting COSAGOV to 55000. We do have Dr. Alton. All right, a lot of numbers to dive into. A backlog of cases reported today. So when the first number came out, 5,501 new cases that takes some diving into it brings a total to 27,047 positive cases since the city and the county entered this pandemic, but only 691 of them are truly new cases. The rest largely have to do to it with a two week delay in the state testing lab that they just got to and 811 of them were actually from last week but t Metro Health updated their systems as well. So there was a backlog at both the state, m m most from the state, yes. and then also from Metro Health. So of those 5,500 new cases, 3,900 of those were because of a two-week delay in the state testing. Then again, as you said, 811 were from a digital backlog, as the mayor put it, uh, from Metro Health. There were 21 new deaths to report, 10 of those coming from what are referred to as congregate settings, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, uh, but also the additional 11. Uh, those were people between the ages of 20 and 90 who have died within our community. Hospitals. Again, uh, 20. 20s, and 90 the age for the deaths, that's the range. And 90, yes. For these 21. A huge yeah. range. Hospitalizations, that number slightly down uh, as it has been trending down over the last few days. Uh, that's certainly a very small silver lining uh, that uh, the judge pointed out. Yep, we'll continue to, of course, monitor the latest numbers. We have an interview coming up with infectious disease doctor Ruth Bergeron. A little bit later, she'll talk about the trends and what she sees 
in these numbers that were just reported today. And we do hope to, I mentioned this before we got into that briefing, we do hope to address with her the issue of the probable cases versus confirmed cases because that is not something that we heard the mayor or the judge address in the briefing. Yeah, both of those cases involve positive tests. It's just which tests? How they break down. We'll yeah. talk about that coming up. Sports is up next. It's pretty much what I expected. Um, it's well, the first couple of days were, were a little bit boring and in, inside the room, but ever since then, like we've been able to hang out with with each other, like play some games, play ping pong, stuff like that. So it's really, really not that bad. Life in the bubble doesn't bother Spurs center Jakob Pearl and Big Board Sports. The Spurs are two weeks and one day away from restarting the season in Orlando. First up, the Sacramento Kings, July 31st. Heading into the final eight games of the regular season, Coach Pop said in the Spurs specific situation, development is more important than anything right now. So it sounds like the young guns will get significant playing time. And according to Rudy Gay, those young guys are bringing it in Orlando. They're working their ass off. Um, they're, they're coming out here and they're playing with desperation. Um, if they really want to play, they really want to prove something. So, you know, this is a good opportunity for them. Um, play against obviously the best competition in the world during the season and in season kind of play. Um, and just to see where they can be. Definitely. I think any opportunity and every opportunity for the young guys is a great one. So I think going out here, wherever we put out on the court and uh, wherever we got to do, I think uh, we're excited to go out there and do it. Center Jakob Perdo is now the Spurs' number one big man. Trey Lyles is out for the rest of the season because of an appendectomy. And LaMarcus Aldridge is out recovering from shoulder surgery. Yesterday, Perdo was asked about stepping it up with L.A. out of action. I'm personally taking on the challenge, um, but I think yeah. at the end of the day, it's going to have to be a team effort from all of us to, to fill that hole because he wasn't only our, our best center, like he was one of our, our main two guys are our main scorers so I, I feel like we're gonna have to have people from from all over the team step up obviously i'm gonna try and come in and, and really help out with a with a good inside presence and and take up as much of the slack as possible recently signed center power forward tyler zeller could see some playing time with the spurs shorthanded on the front line San Antonio FC is ready to resume the USL championship season tomorrow night at Rio Grande Valley FC. San Antonio's second match of this season and first since Saturday, March 7th, when they beat Real Monarchs SLC 1-0 in the season opener. After that, the league was shut down because of COVID-19. Nearly 19 weeks later, SAFC is more than excited for the USL championship season reboot. We want to put our best foot forward be a great representation of our fans, of our city, of our club. And hopefully that means getting three points and bringing them back to San Antonio. Yeah, we're flying. We're ready to go. Um, everybody's pumped up. Obviously, have been laying dormant for a while, so um, just ready to go all out. The RGV FC Toros will host San Antonio FC tomorrow night at 8. If you plan to go to the match, you must wear a mask to get in, and you are strongly encouraged to wear it at all times. And congratulations to Wendell Harris. He was named head football coach and boys athletic coordinator at Burbank High School. This will be his first varsity football head coaching job. He was hired as Burbank's defensive football coordinator in 2018. Now we just wait to see if we have a high school football season. Yeah. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Our case at Q&A coming up next. Time now for today's KSAT Q&A with Dr. Ruth Berggren from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, thanks for being with us today. Let's first start by talking about probable cases versus confirmed cases. We know that the state health department removed close to 4,000 cases from San Antonio's count because they are considered probable. Can you explain the difference and why a probable case is even taken into account? Yes, yeah, so this relates to two different kinds of tests that we have available. One is called the PCR test. It's a molecular test that's actually detecting nucleic acid from the virus in our noses. The other one is an antigen test, which is looking for proteins that are made by the virus also in our noses. Both tests have been um, emergency use approved by the CDC, 
And they're just a little bit different with how sensitive and specific they are. But what's important to know is that this antigen test, which is what they're using for the probable cases, is highly, highly specific. In other words, if you have a, fo a positive it is not a fake positive, it is a positive. The problem with that one is if you have a negative, it could be a fake negative or a false negative and you might need a PCR test to confirm it. So um, the, the reason for the change is to make sure that there's consistent reporting for comparison among Texas cities. But if what we care about is the number of cases that we have, then we should look at the total, the confirmed plus the probable, because this is a very good test that's being used and it helps us. Is it, is it a big deal? No, I, I really don't think it is. And Metro Health has broken down those numbers for us in a press release that they sent out today. So um, if we take them all together, we have over 21,000 cases cumulatively. Um, we could subtract something somewhere around 3,500 cases from the total. Um, and we still, we still have hospitals that are at their capacity and a hospital system that is extremely stressed. We still have nearly a quarter of the people who are coming to be tested showing positive rates. I think it's 22.6% or something like that right, right in, now. Any way you look at the numbers, that's that's the way it breaks down. Talk about the curve. You've talked a lot about the, the, the graphs that you've looked at and some of the prognostications out there. What are you seeing in the latest curve? Well, how close are we to a peak? or to a downward trend. Okay, can you, are you able to project that now? I think we've got, I think Bill has it, yeah. Okay, so what, what we see in that SG2 curve, as we've seen before, is there's a dotted blue line that represents where we actually are in terms of real numbers. The y-axis, remember, is people in the hospital. These are COVID positive hospitalizations. The x-axis is time. And you see that there's an orangish or grayish line um, that is above the dotted blue line. That is the projection. And what you see is that we have reached a leveling off, but it's at a very high level. This is what I call a high plateau. I'm happy that our dotted blue is slightly below what, what we projected as what could have been. But um, I am concerned that we're going to re remain at this level for another week or two before we start coming down off of that high plateau. This is concerning because it doesn't give us any relief in the hospitals where the, we are just about at our maximum capacity uh, for beds and ventilators and medication. We are seeing in the, the daily briefings, uh, the mayor has made note of a decrease in hospitalizations, however slight, over the last few days. Is it substantial enough for you to alleviate any of that concern? No, I think our, our level of concern needs to remain exactly where it's been. The fact that it's leveling off means that the messaging is is working. People are paying attention and we're not seeing new additional infections, but we're still bearing the brunt of what happened two weeks ago and it's, it's hospitals are full. I think what we saw today was 0% increase in hospitalizations. That doesn't mean we decreased really yet. And if we've decreased from more recent numbers, uh, from later today, then they're tiny. So it means that we we can be thankful that we're not rising, but we need to remain vigilant and continue what we're doing to prevent further cases and to alleviate the stress on our healthcare workers. A lot of the school districts made decisions today that they were going to delay in-person classes until at least after Labor Day. When you look at that graph and you look at the trends that we're seeing, your thoughts on that decision? Yes, I think it's a wise decision and it's within the TEA guidelines. Um, the superintendents who met today with Metro Health and other members of our community um, with a committee that included uh, UT Health and, and others, um, they, they looked at all of this and they thought about the needs of the kids. And, you know, nobody wants to reopen um, schools where there might be crowds of people coming together when the hospital system is very stressed. But a metric that they're looking at very closely, according to Dr. Wu, our medical director at Metro Health, is the percent positivity rate. So I mentioned earlier, our current percent positive lab tests in the community right now is actually 24.2%. Around the end of May, we were between five and 10%. And that's what we'd like to get back to for people to have a good comfort level with having schools reopen. And remember, when they reopen with in-person uh, classes, 
that is going to have to be a new normal with masking and distancing and hand washing, um, nothing like what people are used to from the past. And another quick point I want to make about back to school, even though we're talking about schools opening for virtual learning for the first three weeks or up to Labor Day, people still need to have met the vaccination requirements. So even if you're learning at home, you still have to get vaccinated. And we're very interested in people listening to that message. We don't want children missing out on their routine pediatric vaccination schedule because of this COVID mess that we're in. So please get your kids vaccinated. All right, Dr. Ruth Bergwin, thank you so much as always. We'll see you tonight on the night beat at 10. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back. News around America now retail sales rising for the second month in a row as shoppers headed back to the stores during this pandemic. That's from a new report which showed that retail sales rose 7.5 percent in June from the prior month. Analysts have cautioned the recovery may be short lived if consumers become less willing to spend on discretionary items like clothes. A Chipotle Mexican Grill opening its 100th Chipotle Lane. It's a drive through digital order pickup lane. That one is opening in Columbus, Ohio, where the first Chipotle lane first debuted two years ago. Despite or maybe because of the coronavirus pandemic, Chipotle's digital business grew more than 80% in year to year sales. Chipotle is also looking to hire up to 10,000 new employees within the next few months. Look outside with live cam this evening, 97. We've been talking about how that was going to feel good <laughs> at some point. I mean, it's all relative. Huh? Well, it is. When you think about it, Death Valley is like 125 to 128 these days. That's, I don't, why do we want to feel Yeah, that? that's, that's not, not Death Valley's not on my ideal places to live. San Antonio <laughs> is on my list of ideal it, places. It is a very cool place to visit, though. I have to tell you, fascinating. It was only 123 when I was there, so I couldn't quite rival the 128, but... It was good. Anyway, we have a space station flyover to talk about this evening. If you missed last night's, you can catch tonight's 8.56 p.m. Look to the southwest. It's only going to last six minutes. It'll go from the southwest to the northeast. That's 8.56 p.m. Get the kids outside and check it out. All right, we're going to talk about our full forecast and a slight chance of rain coming up. A smidge of relief out there today and, and you know okay so today is yes it's Thursday Thursday uh, and uh -huh. thermometer uh -huh. Thursday and I had a thermometer question what yes I did you did remember I asked you the question like when uh -huh. it gets so hot if if ah uh, yes if the alcohol rises to the top of the thermometer will it burst it like you see like you know in, in some cartoons and <laughs> Weather hope, forecast, I'm like the it's is yes. thermometer bursting and weather. A sound effect. It yeah. would be cool if it did, but no. I actually create a secondary bulb on the top of the glass. And How about it for not overflow. your thermometers, like just a regular thermometer? What if it wasn't a Caskey special? Sounds like a time to experiment. <laughs> Safety glasses, check. I'm in. I'm <laughs> All in. Right. Uh, let, let's talk about our weather, then we'll get into thermometer Thursday and uh, what I have for you this week. Uh, very interesting. These patchy clouds we have right now, and even those high thin clouds are moving on out of here. Patchy clouds are basically falling apart. They're dissipating with the loss of daytime heating. Those high clouds are just drifting westward. I still think very good viewing for the International Space Station later this evening. 8.56 p.m., look to the southwest. It'll pass almost directly overhead and then go disappear to the northeast. So you can see... Uh, this activity here, good rain, New Orleans area, southern Louisiana and out over the Gulf of Mexico there. Nice little disturbance we have in the atmosphere. We often talk, talk about the bumps in the flow being the disturbances. Well, this is an upside down bump. It's an inverted trough that's headed our way and it has decent moisture and good energy with it right now. But by the time it gets here, we're not expecting much left of this. Unfortunately, we'll have the typical situation. Morning clouds, low clouds to start the day, then a decent amount of sunshine into the midday and afternoon. And by those afternoon hours, we'll see some showers along the coastline. I think that's pretty likely. It's just they're going to be confined mainly to within a county or two of the Gulf coastline around San Antonio. 10% chance. That's what we're giving it tomorrow and even on into Saturday, at least Saturday morning with that disturbance lingering over uh, South Texas. Then next week we could see 
another type of disturbance, but really 10% chances. All we think we're looking at right now. 97 degrees feels like it's three degrees warmer when you factor in the humidity dew point of 65. By the way, Randolph at 100 New Braunfels 101 pleasant to 99. Hondo right at the century mark right now and Del Rio 104, not even close to the record today, actually about four or five degrees shy, which is quite a contrast to the rest of the week that we had starting on Monday. 78 tomorrow morning with the low clouds, the 99 for the high temperature. We keep trimming back the temperatures a little bit and will continue to do so into the upcoming weekend. I mean, we're talking 96 for the high on Saturday, and that's pretty close to average for this time of year. And then mid to upper 90s basically this weekend all the way into next week with, you guessed it, decent amount of sunshine, just those fair weather patchy clouds. All right, a couple weeks ago, we talked about this thermometer that I made for a friend in Denver. He said, Adam, it's broken. We had a hailstorm. Didn't make it through the hailstorm. I think that's what broke it. Hmm. <laughs> so is this thermometer really broken? You look at the glass. It's all intact. See, look, I can, I'm not going to get any cut fingers. It's all intact. And let's go to the graphics. You look closely at the liquid inside it, and guess what? you'll actually see some liquid inside it. Take a, there's a close look. I measured the temperature inside earlier today. Look at that arrow. That's the liquid still inside the glass, taking a very accurate measurement of the temperature. So this is not a broken thermometer. No, 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 no. What this is, my friends, sun damage. Now, not only will a uh, liquid in glass or really any thermometer exposed directly to sun give you an extremely inflated reading, but particularly thermometers of the homemade variety, it will quickly cause the coloring to basically get wiped away and it uh, washes it all out and turns the alcohol to a clear color. So all thermometers should be in full shade. Now some electronic ones have their own shaded container, Nonetheless, all thermometers should be in the shade and even a few hours of direct sun per day will ultimately cause this kind of damage. And this one I made back in 2016 took just, you know, four, three, four years and boom, there you have it. This is what happens to it. So it fades the coloring. That's just one of the side effects. Hey, Marilyn Kunkel of Victoria, you're this week's homemade thermometer winner. And I know Marilyn, you're going to hang it in full shade. So I'm guessing Good porch. I'm guessing your friend in Denver, you basically have to make him a new thermometer itself. You can't save that one. I can save the backboard. Yes. I can do thermometer, thermometer surgery, itself. but I have to get rid of the scale because every thermometer has its own unique scale. So it, yeah. it, it's a whole new yeah, apparatus. But thermometer broken? Nope. Nope. I like thermometer surgery. <laughs> it's been done. In case you missed it. You can scrub it in with me next, next time. Scalpel. <laughs> Stat. <laughs> Here's today's in case you missed it. First responders and other high risk frontline workers encouraged to participate in a COVID-19 vaccine trial. It's getting ready to begin here in San Antonio. Clinical Trials of Texas, located in the medical center area, is looking for five to 600 people interested in participating in a COVID-19 vaccine study set to begin July 27th. The intent is that the vaccine, which is being manufactured by the company Moderno, creates antibodies that will protect against the virus. If trials are successful, it still must be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. A 16-year-old boy in the hospital after he was shot this afternoon in West Bear County, they were originally told the teen shot himself, but after investigating, the sheriff's office now says the teen and some friends were playing with a gun when someone shot him in the upper body. The sheriff's office says they are investigating the shooting as a homicide in the event the teen does not survive. People are panicking, thinking I'm about to shut down Texas again. The answer is no, that is not the goal. Governor Greg Abbott addressing rumors of another mandatory lockdown. In an interview with our sister station in Houston, KPRC, last night the governor clarified verified his intentions. What I want to do is to make sure that everyone begins to wear a mask so that we will be able to get COVID-19 under control so that we will not have to shut Texas back down. The passing of the Bear County Emergency Management Coordinator on Tuesday, touching many of those who knew and worked with Kyle Coleman. He died Tuesday of COVID-19 complications. This afternoon, a
procession escorted his hearse from the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office to a local funeral home. Funeral arrangements are pending. Bush Beer adding a new choice to its beer lineup, Bush Light Apple. The brewer says the limited edition brew is a lager with a crisp light flavor. In a commercial, Bush's mascot, Bush Guy, calls the new flavor, quote, a groundbreaking advancement in beerology. <laughs> I know. You can get it through October in select states. According to the Bush website, it is available here in San Antonio. To find a store near you, go to the Find a Store search page on Bush's website. Get to the core of that story. Did you know Bush, let, Bush is made of corn? I did. Yeah, I learned that from you, actually. Made with corn. Made with corn. Yeah. That's why you support it. That is. Nebraska man. That's right. All right, tomorrow, more of the same. 99 the high temperature. If we're lucky, a pop-up shower, too, especially along the coastal plain. But uh, don't get your hopes up over that. And at least temperatures will be under 100 here. Time to end this show. He's swiffering the weather center. Yeah. We got to go. That's right, I am.